So I'll finish up with another uh, uh, topic in valvular disease, and I just put this into the handout. Uh, this is the uh, older guidelines from the ASE on echo, press, the echo assessment of prosthetic valves 2009, and then this has been alluded to uh, earlier. The more current uh, guidelines are from the European uh, uh, group <coughs> and recommendations of imaging. This is a really good uh, uh, paper. So I'll present it. This is a 48-year-old woman who presented initially with aortic stenosis. She was known to have a systolic murmur as a child. Uh, she was evaluated with echo back then and told no intervention necessary and then never had anything followed until she developed dyspnea on exertion, angina, and exertional presyncope. And she had that for about two months before she was eventually seen by a cardiologist locally. And uh, she had signs of significant uh, uh, severe aortic stenosis on clinical examination. Severe AS was found on her echo. And she had uh, a little bit of stenosis in her LAD. And then she had a, a diminutive right coronary artery, but it happened to have an anomalous origin near the origin of her left coronary artery. Uh, her, her maximum aortic diameter was 3.4 cm, and it was thought that her valve, although heavily calcified, was probably bicuspid, uh, difficult to assess with that degree of calcification, and no coarctation. So she was sent rather urgently to uh, Mayo for surgery, for a surgical consultation, and at the time she arrived, we did our own echo, and you can see she's, her LVOT diameter was 19 millimeters, mean gradient was 72 millimeters of mercury, and valve area 0.68. She still had preserved ejection fraction. We got a normal ascending aorta diameter. Also no signs of coarctation in the abdominal aorta, and she, wasn't, she didn't have pulmonary hypertension. So she was, in fact, at surgery found to have a bicuspid valve. Uh, that was found on pre-bypass TE imaging and on surgical and pathologic uh, inspection. Her, she, had, she had, because she only had a 19 millimeter LVOT diameter, she had a posterior aortic root enlargement with pericardium. But even then, uh, the largest valve that could be put in was a 19 millimeter carbometic, so that's a bileaflet mechanical prosthesis. She was found to have a little subvalvular web uh, that was attached to the mitral leaflet and the septum thought not to be obstructive uh, by either the TEE or by the surgeon, but it was, it was resected. And she had an uneventful course dismissed on hospital day five. Hemoglobin was 8.1, as it often is, uh, on pre-dismissal. I mean, it's often low like that. Here's her pre-dismissal echocardiogram. You can see she's still got normal LV function, aortic diameter 3.5 there. Difficult to get uh, images of the bileaflets as it often is, particularly with smaller prosthetic valves, but we can see that the color, here, here's the outflow track, the color really doesn't accelerate till the level of the prosthesis, and then it doesn't get turbulent. It's, it's pretty laminar flow, so that's reassuring. Same in short axis, no AR. Uh, we couldn't even see the little normal leakage jets. We measured 19 millimeters for her outflow tract, which fit with the measurement of the valve, of course. And being careful to avoid the zone of flow convergence, we got a TVI for outflow tract of 28 centimeters. So she had a uh, stroke volume index that was within normal limits, 42 cc's per minute. And when we looked at her aortic valve uh, from the apex, it, the mean gradient was 21 but going to right parasternal, now this is the pre-dismissal image, she's got a hemoglobin of 8.1, but nevertheless she's got a mechanical bileaflet prosthesis with a mean gradient of 43. And uh, if we index that to her body surface area, it's 0.53 centimeters squared per meter squared. And she still had preserved ejection fraction, as I said before. So the question is, is this pathologic obstruction, something went on during the, during the surgery, there's something uh, obstructing the valve, or is this just because she's got a small valve and she's got prosthesis patient mismatch? And I just put in there in the, the uh, American Society of Echo Guidelines was, as I remember, at least one of the, was the first time that this strategy of looking at the acceleration time of the aortic prosthetic CW signal uh, is used to try to distinguish between pathologic and functional obstruction. 
with the cutoff being roughly 100 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds or more, it is obstructed uh, pathologically, and less than that, it's likely functional. After that, that came from uh, Zogby, actually. He was the chair of the writing group, and he had done a, uh, he and his colleagues had a small group of patients that supported that contention. And then later, in 2011, they came out with this larger paper. And uh, this is a nice paper because it, it has the spe sensitivity, specificity, and, and accuracy uh, for using the uh, acceleration time and the acceleration time to ejection time ratio, which actually ends up being uh, the, the more useful or the more, the more accurate, let's say. Uh, and so this just gives you uh, the percentages that you can distinguish pathologic from functional. So this is bioprosthetic valves and mechanical valves, and you can see that if we look at just the acceleration time for mechanical valves, sensitivity of 82%, specificity 97, and if we use the ratio, it's a, a sensitivity and specificity of 82.91, so you put the two together and, and you're pretty high up there. She had a pointed contour and her acceleration time was 92 milliseconds, so it fell below the cutoff. Uh, uh, and we decided she likely had functional obstruction. This is just another uh, patient that has a 19 millimeter uh, bjork shiley prosthesis that was, uh, uh, had panis uh, under it, and you can see the acceleration time here is 118 milliseconds, so that's, that's what we're looking for. Now, so we said she had, we diagnosed at that point in time likely prosthesis patient mismatch. It's severe if it's less than or equal to 0.65, which she was. And even with severe mismatch, you rarely see gradients as high as hers, as 43 or 50. You often see them in the 20s or maybe the low 30s. But we have seen patients uh, with, with gradients this high that we have on long-term attributed to prosthesis patient mismatch. Often the patient has a narrow left ventricular outflow tract, not just at the annulus level, but it looks narrow throughout, not a, not a real tight tunnel, but it, it doesn't expand as much as it should. And uh, the, the reason that we think that it's import, most important in the long run is because the patient, it's, it always occurs in the setting, in the aortic valve, in the setting of aortic stenosis, small uh, patients, usually small diameter, but they have established hypertrophy from aortic stenosis, and the fact that they have a higher gradient residually doesn't allow the hypertrophy to regress like it would if they had a, a, normally, uh, a normal gradient and normal uh, valve area. Now, looking at at the actual significance of it, the, the, this is a large paper from uh, Dubonnel and Pibaro. You know, they've, they've written a lot about it. Pibaro is also the low ejection fraction, or I mean normal ejection fraction, low flow aortic stenosis guy. But they looked at this large cohort of patients and they found that, uh, that severe uh, mismatch was, increased, uh, was associated with increased mortality in their whole cohort. But it was really when you looked, when you broke it down, it was associated with increased mortality for patients that were less than 70 years old and for whom their uh, body mass index was less than 30. So if the mismatch was occurring just because they had a normal effective orifice area but they had a huge uh, body surface area, then it wasn't as important. Uh, but moderate PPM affected survival for patients, so just moderate PPM uh, for patients with EF less than 50%. So I think one of the take-home messages is it didn't apply to this woman, but if you have, PP, if you have a patient uh, going into the surgery with severe aortic stenosis that already has a reduced ejection fraction, then getting the most efficient valve into place has to be a priority with them because if they get mismatched, then uh, it's a real serious thing. So that was her pre-dismissal echo. Now, I, when we brought her back, we did CT scanning to show that the to, to make sure the discs were moving normally, and they were, and there was no evidence of any kind of material uh, clot or otherwise around the valve. Uh, we had her stress test, and she, while she had a below average VO2, she wasn't felt to have uh, an abnormal cardiac response at that time. Her mean gradient, uh, the 43 was the lowest we saw. It, after she recovered, it actually went up, not down, and stayed around 50. Acceleration time you can see is now bordering on 100, and, and her, uh, this, the cutoff for the AT divided by ET is 0.37, so she was under that. Well, this just shows the follow-up. We followed her very carefully because of this unusual situation with the high gradient. 
And if we look at her mean gradient with time, as I said, it went up at one point as high as 57, 56 here. You can see her effective uh, indexed effective orifice area was, was quite low. And at this point in time when she hit 60, uh, up until this time she was asymptomatic. But when she hit that uh, visit with the 60 millimeter mercury gradient, she had developed dyspnea on exertion. And then just prior to that visit had uh, described angina. She underwent a treadmill test at that time and now there was evidence of uh, impaired uh, uh, cardiac output. And so there were a couple choices here. I know Dr. Schaff has, uh, has had cases where he'll do apical aortic conduits on these kind of individuals, uh, would be one strategy. Uh, she was actually referred for a Kono procedure, which is uh, an aortoventriculoplasty and uh, uh, using, taking part of the right ventricle to enlarge the, uh, out the uh, annulus further. Because remember, she already had pericardial patch enlargement at the time of the initial insertion. And they were able to get a 21 millimeter onyx prosthesis in. They knew going in that they were likely to transect that little anomalous right coronary artery, and so she, that got vein grafted, and then she had to have reconstruction of the outflow tract, which is part of the procedure with, uh, that should say, preserved bovine pericardium. And then she did develop post-op heart block and uh, required a pacemaker. But you can see her gradient uh, with the new procedure is 10 millimeters of mercury, and it was actually, when I saw her post-operatively, and, and uh, she had already been told that, but I w when I was discussing it with her, she said it was the first time in five years that her gradient had been below 50. <laughs> but, um, so she had I, a prosthesis patient mismatch. At the end, when the surgeon took out the valve, he didn't describe any thrombus or panis on the valve and said uh, what he scraped away was just consistent with the uh, sewing ring material. The pathologist said there were little pieces of tissue in there that could have been panis, and I suspect she probably did get a very small rim of panis there at the end, and that was what accelerated her that last little bit to make her symptomatic. But anyway, so that was severe patient prosthesis mismatch uh, and severe enough that a patient actually had to undergo reoperation eventually.